All right. Good evening, everyone. Happy Saturday. Happy spring. Uh, my name is Ivan Salinas. I'm the programs manager here at Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. Welcome to the Wanda Coleman Theater and to tonight's program, Occult Experiments of Queer Transdisciplinary Poetics. I want to start off by acknowledging our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva peoples. We recognize the Tongva as the first peoples of this land. We acknowledge the wrong done to indigenous communities through colonialism and genocidal practices. And as an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting their stories and cultures. To share a few words about our space, we, Beyond Baroque is a nonprofit literary arts organization founded in 1968 by George Drury Smith, uh, what first began as an experimental literary arts magazine, then uh, evolved into a bookstore, first located in Abbott Kinney, uh, just down the street, and later moved into this building, which used to be the original Venice City Hall. And it operated as such until the late 70s, uh, once Beyond Broke moved into the space to become a house for poets, writers, and artists for the community of Venice and Los Angeles. We've uh, been around for the last 55 years, and we continue that legacy through extensive programming from readings with emerging and established authors to exhibitions in the Mike Kelly Gallery, as well as craft workshops in poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. This month, we'll be featuring work in translation with Latin American poets, including Frank Baez, Margarita Pintado Burgos, Carlo Acevedo, and Gloria Alvarez. Uh, that is also a reading that uh, Ramon Garcia put together uh, with uh, translator Anthony Seidman. And uh, we're also having a group reading with Armenian American authors featuring Nancy Agabian, among a few other poets. And we're ending the month with the third edition of the Poetry Film Festival. And tickets are out now if you're interested in seeing this merging of cinema and text on the big screen. Uh, you can also sign up to our historic Monday night fiction workshop and our Wednesday night poetry workshop happening every week on Zoom. We also have memberships available if you'd like to donate to Beyond Baroque, see more programs uh, like the ones today, and help us continue our mission to provide a space for poets internationally and to the local LA community. It's all thanks to your support, and uh, we're here for, uh, for you all, and thanks to you all. And lastly, if you want to know more about any of the poets uh, reading tonight, also, about our weekly events, um, you can see that on our website. Uh, but today, we did print out a program that has all of the poets' bios. Uh, we are sort of skip skipping the um, the reading of those so that there's more time to hear of each of them. And also, uh, they'll be engaging in a Q&A conversation afterwards. So there will be plenty of time for that. Um, I will just say that uh, there is a slight change of order in the way that you see them, but we are starting first with uh, Ramon Garcia saying a few words about the reading itself, and then we'll hear from Brooke Palmieri, then Shirley Marlowe, and lastly with Noel Alumet and Kay Bradford. So uh, please give a round of applause to Ramon Garcia, organizer and uh, <laughs> vice president of the on board for trustees. <clears throat> Thank you, Ivan. Good night and welcome. Uh, are there, their books are also available in the bookstore, right? Yes. Yeah, our presenters' books are in the bookstore. Um, so as vice president of the board of trustees at Beyond Baroque, I welcome you to what I'm sure will be a memorable event. <clears throat> As a board member, I've been interested in continuing Beyond Baroque's history of experimentation, openness, and diversity of expression. I want to thank Executive Director Quentin Ring, 
Um, programs Manager, Evan Salinas, Associate Director, Jimmy Vega, and Bookstore and Programs Assistant, uh, Genesis Perez, for their support and help in curating tonight's event. Tonight's program, Occult Experiments, Queer Transdisciplinary Poetics, continues beyond Baroque's history of presenting challenging work at the intersection of writing and art. In 2021, we hosted one of our most successful exhibitions in the Mike Kelly Gallery on the work of local artist Paulina Peavy, titled Paulina Peavy, an Ethereum Channeler. Peavy painted and wrote by channeling an astral culture being, a UFO, named Locamo, and she believed that human evolution would lead to an androgynous one sex through contact with aliens. The rave reviews the exhibition received was evidence that the spiritual and the occult in art had finally garnered art world legitimacy. But this is a very recent occurrence. It bears remembering that W.H. Auden, ardent admirer of Irish Nobel laureate poet William Butler Yeats, nonetheless dismiss Yeats' deep, if lifelong, investment in the esoteric as embarrassing, nonsense, and Southern Californian. <laughs> Auden's trivialization of Yeats's complex mysticism is of course based on the stereotype of Los Angeles as a home to wacky pseudo-religions and weirdo cults. Rather than counter an eccentric view of the city and its unique countercultures, I would suggest that we claim and embrace them. Armed with Jean Cocteau's subversive advice to the queerly inclined, quote, that which people reproach you for, cultivate it, it is you. While we can have a sense of humor in approaching the subject, it is a fact, although not always acknowledged or only reluctantly so, that writers as significant as William Blake, Hart Crane, and Michaud Antonin Artaud, Sylvia Plath, James Merrill, and many others have incorporated mystical practices in their writing. In Latin America, both the Peruvian poet Rodolfo Ginostrosa and the Argentinian poet Gloria Rosco wrote, wrote horoscopes for popular newspapers. Gloria Rosco wrote one of her most accomplished books, Canto a Berenice, Songs for Berenice, to communicate with her divine cat, Berenice. There are many other poets we could mention as the mystical aspect in poetry is not in any way marginal, even though it has often been made so by limited literary critics. The readers and performers tonight are writers who have some of the spiritual and multidisciplinary interests that have historically been reproached, but that tonight we will embrace. After the reading, I will lead a discussion with our participants and we'll open it up for questions from you, the audience. Enjoy the program and I will see you on the other side. <laughs> Good evening. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for that introduction, Ramon. Um, I'm gonna read for the first time uh, from a book that I have out, uh, coming out uh, autumn 2025. Um, it's called Bargain Witch and it's coming out with Dopamine Books, uh, which is based right here in LA. And the Bargain Witch is sort of a fusion of a uh, memoir about my, my own life as a queer trans witch dating back to my childhood, um, sort of filtered through my experience working in an occult bookshop in London for years. And the strange people I met there, the spooky experiences I had, the books I put in people's hands that I hope changed their lives, um, the people who came back and told me the books I'd put in their hands changed their lives. And um, it sort of it uses that perspective to have a deep dive into queer cultures of witchcraft. Um, so I'm gonna read you from the, uh, an excerpt from the first chapter that I hope you can think of as um, an open invitation for yourselves to go home and light candles for yourselves after you, after you leave tonight or to um, give your whole life over to practicing witchcraft if you want. It's a polytheistic religion, so there's no jealousy with any other religious or spiritual practice you may have. Um, and so yes, consider this your open invitation. 
I think a modern witch is someone who wants to find God, namely a God that hasn't been tarnished by association with all the terrible things humans do to one another. As a child, I worked spells in the bathtub and in nearby parks without knowing it to be witchcraft. As a teenager, witchcraft became the first form of rebellion I could grasp for, a trail of crumbs leading outside of Christianity. I followed the devil to the edge of Christian doctrine, and when I stepped outside it, he dissolved into something much bigger. Once I was out there, being a witch became less about chanting Edgar Allan Poe in a local graveyard and more about building correspondences between nature and nurture, hitching my desires onto cosmic forces with the help of prayers, the stars, and the elements. Being a witch became about gathering more information to sift through as time went on, from experience, from fantasy, from history, from books and angel fire websites. Assembling a critical mass of characters from the past whose fragmented remains contained even smaller fragments of a lust for the weird, making my own inheritance where I'd otherwise get nothing. I'd always have magic. But the bulk of evidence for now about witchcraft has been generated under duress. Testimonials taken by panicked individuals suffering illness or the death of a loved one, or imprisoned in squalid conditions or after torture. The chief religion of bureaucracy, Christianity, produces dogmas, laws, hierarchies, entire governments based on interpretations of scriptures. It's a lot of paperwork. And in its hunger to acquire wealth and power and dominion over souls, there's also a lot of paperwork around heresy, tracts and treatises, testimonies and court records, in print and in manuscript. While journals of demonic and angelic communications detailing rituals, invocations, and visions do survive, and recipe books of housewives and cunning folk, and folk knowledge handed down over centuries and recorded in story and song, these are all sources of information about what exists beyond the physical world and what witches do. But the majority of what we have about witches is court records and the testimonies of angry men who cannot be trusted. So the magic lies in their interpretation. We know people were burned as witches in the past, but we can never know enough about what these people were actually like. So the spiritual essence of modern witchcraft requires digging down into the past and finding what rings true for you, intuitively assembling the right lure for the right occasion, building elaborate rituals from scraps, and in my case, making treasure out of trash. The bitchiness of modern witchcraft comes from resurfacing and thinking that your interpretation is somehow truer than someone else's, forgetting it was all an interpretation to begin with, a grasping at the dark. Browse any occult bookshop, and mine was no exception, for more than a few minutes and you'll start to overhear it, which is kind of dissing one another, claiming so-and-so doesn't know enough, or isn't initiated into the right line, or isn't doing it right. So what is a witch? What does it mean to claim to be a witch? In the bookshop, people would ask me again and again, are you, you know, one of them, a witch? Everyone wanted to know who they were dealing with. The trick was saying yes in a way that was gentle to those who were asking the question more of themselves than of me, a way that gave permission. I would say to them, yes, I am a witch. My life is structured like the tides according to the phases of the moon. I like working in the dark and occasionally feeling afraid of it. And I anoint candles and burn herbs to give thanks to forces beyond my human understanding. I believe in mystery and change and I long to embed myself in some divine pattern, something bigger. Or saying, yes, I'm a witch, in a way that shamed the skeptics who wanted to laugh in my face about it, to make them feel like total losers for doing so. I don't really believe in irony outside of the literary mode. Any person who would take precious minutes from their finite life to walk into an occult bookshop in order to ask about witchcraft must on some level want to be a part of it. But these people all did enter the shop. They did try to engage me in some kind of debate. And believe it or not, they were all straight, cis, white men they were men deluded enough to think that they could be smart enough to actually play devil's advocate. But I was the one getting paid to talk to them and answer their questions. They were just wasting their own time, too uptight to surrender. So they were destined to miss out on all the fun. How sad that these skeptics would deny themselves pleasure in the safety of feigned aloofness, would choose the minor rush of brain chemicals released during bad conversation, rather than the major one you get from drawing down the moon buck naked. But there was a queer equivalent to this, too. I'd seen it. Closet cases. When I worked in a gay bookshop years later, we'd get prank callers all the time, breathing down the line, laughing, or asking us rude questions. And our company line to respond to these people was, thanks for calling. I hope we'll be able to welcome you to the shop soon. And then there was a third yes 
to the initiate witch who wanted some sense of my bona fides, should they respect me or not. As someone raised in a hugely fucked up Catholic setting that nearly taught me to kill myself, I had promised myself as a teenager that I would never look for God and organize religion again. My approach to these witches was to tread very gently and not let myself get walked all over. There's this idea that belonging to a coven or being initiated into a particular tradition is superior to self-initiation. But all I care about then and now is spiritual ecstasy and cosmic connection, which I'm certain I experience. As a self-initiate, I have nothing on my side but time, a handful of spooky encounters with the unknown, and shocking occurrences that even if they were coincidence, make the hair stand up on the back of my neck with wonder and awe. I have basked in divine love. I have been shook by holy terror. I have run out of words to describe the majesty and beauty and poetry of beholding my life unfold within a golden cosmic purpose that links me to every soul I share the animistic earth with. I know what I know. All of which is to say a witch is nothing if not a relational being. Relational to organized religion, to capitalism, to science. Relational to a sprawling counterculture of freaks and weirdos and artists and seekers. I had a lot of sympathy for my interactions with the different visitors that would come to our shop, who each had their own links to these big themes. We were all just trying to find a way to lick our respective wounds and make some meaning out of life. By night, I was trying to finish up a PhD at that time on the revolutionary religious radicals of late 17th century England, a profusion of heretics with very visceral embodied names like diggers, levelers, ranters, seekers, quakers, heretics who hated priests, heretics who killed monarchs, who were beaten in prison for claiming that ultimately no mortal had the right to get between them and their experience of God. These groups were written about in lurid terms by establishment priests and government officials. They were described as swarms of pestilence as hell broke loose across England. They were seen as serious threats to stability, to power. They were seen as ill omens that had to be exterminated in order to bring about times of prosperity. The hallmark of spirituality among these different groups was their enthusiasm, a zeal for discussion, debate, dissent, schism. They were always arguing in person and in print, breaking up, exploding into new groups based on new visions. And here I was in London over 350 years later, still riding that wave, surrounded in my waking life by essentially mystical people squabbling over their visions. The mystical underground was thriving in my place and time. I felt the pulse of it. I felt also that the gossip and the drama that it created was just part and parcel to the heightened spiritual experience, kicked up in a churn of wild enthusiasm. The challenge was not to take any of it too seriously or let spiritual difference harden into some kind of religious resentment or rivalry. Let everyone have their visions. Let everyone pray to their gods. To keep myself gr grounded, I'd clock out from work every night and look at my schedule. Was I spending more time in a circle of power or bitching about other people? Swapping stories with pilgrims at the shop was enough. Gossip is an energizing way to make fast friends and communicate shared values and tastes. Gossip, like astrology, is a very ancient queer art form of knowledge sharing. And what were these people really complaining about was commerce, which I could relate to. I was always broke, too. We were all witches for hire in an expanding world. There was a new cohort of pretty, willowy, white witches emerging on a social media, expanding the boundaries and audience of the witch economy, and we were trying to come to grips with that. We were feeling left behind by it. And that, to my mind, was, above all, the final mark of what makes a witch. After a longing to connect with the divine through nature, after a need to form a DIY spiritual alternative that resists the harm done by organized religion, above all Christianity, and after a tradition of disagreement and gossip and healthy doses as part of a balanced diet, witches find weird ways to very gently make money enough to get by in a hostile world. It comes up again and again in the witch trials. Witches get caught performing services or for seeking revenge when their services aren't contracted. Historically, the trials of witches detail obsession with this moment of the devil's bargain, the pact that witches made with the devil to supposedly gain their power. Endless testimonies in Europe and the United States speculate upon that moment that the man in black appeared, the terms of his bargain, the way in which you close the deal through contract signed in blood, sealed with a kiss on the devil's ass, concluded with a fuck and a gift of furry little animal imps that would carry out all a witch's dirty work. Most of what the trial records and pamphlets about the persecution of witches document are failed bargains, not so much with the devil, but between witches and their neighbors. 
Nowadays, much of the infighting among witches has an economy of its own boiling down to discomfort over who gets to make money through witchcraft. And I was interested in this other kind of bargain typical to witch witches, the way they offer their healing, their intuition, their insights into the future in exchange for subsistence, or the way they cursed when they were denied the basic means of subsistence. And all of these witches do offer quite the bargain. It saves time and money if the tarot reader is strong, if the spell works, and if the god listens. Yes. I wrote this in London, 2017, and it needs to still be said. As a gender non-conforming person, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Readers, friends, colleagues, we who are different, do not fit in, have, been pres have to be present in a larger way. To role model self-care, to say yes, you have every right as a trans person, gender nonconforming, to be here and that the rest of the world actually needs us. From feminists to men trapped by their ideas of masculinity, we help the rest of the world move into the future <laughs> where we carry on no murders or suicides. On the smallest scale, as sensitive people, we encourage others to accept their most gentle, vulnerable parts. Love and courage to you all. Thank you for coming out tonight. I'm going to jump into um, reading Isabel a play is a work in progress from The Wind Blew Through Like a Chorus of Ghosts, a novel. Queer elders, pillar and gender nonconforming swan, plan to travel from Brooklyn to the UK in 2013. After their flights are booked, swan senses something terrible and consults a channeler who states, you were a witch in a past life who was murdered as a teen in 1619. As your trip progresses, you will find out all about that witch. I channeled and researched Isabel's story. Here we go. On summer nights, I slip off after dusk to gather with friends especially on new and full moons. No leaders, a different one drew the circle each time. Disembodied ancestors poured waterfalls of light into our heads. My visions of blue and white flowers in the dark reassured that we were safe. We dance all night, stomping feet to rise earth. Someone shouts freedom. And we respond, freedom! We dance in spiral around hilltops, skirts flying like Saturn, ring, ring, Saturn rings. We continue to dance, improvise a twirl, stretch and hop like egrets, other lumber bear-like. On hotter nights, we dance naked except for our slippers, always merry meet. Wolves cry out. We howl back. We dance for justice in an unjust time. After rain, I always start a flamey fire like no one else. Sun golden on green leaves and snakeskin, I am not afraid of death. Villagers invite me to sit with their ill who in my presence grow patient with their pain. I received my broomstick made of ash that would speak to me in pictures, 
One brought jimson weed, an elder had henbane. We mashed these ingredients into an ointment to fly. Mine was a life worth living. We took off above the hills, our silhouettes black against midnight sky. I fly above innocent villagers, forests, and roads to sea. Late August, sun still warm on my skin, though icy wind aches my ears. I know all fields and wo woods by heart and love darkness. My vision of flowers scatter, which means spies among us. I didn't recognize everyone in the circle and panicked for a breath. How did anyone f know to find us? So many paths in woods, each path led to another field. That night, elders' teeth gleam, youths from town giggle. I hear in their laughter they never lost anyone. Some wore jewelry that made them feel immune to trouble. Early fall, a laird cornered me in a dark street in town. I gathered spirits of night to surround me. I turn to where he looms, my eyes glow. He lurches back, then backs up further with eyes on mine. Once out of range, he turns and runs away. The night is my alley, my friend, my love. Our group gathers at a new secret location. We play, pit, we play kissing games one night. Kiss person on your right, then kiss the person to your left. Lots of kissing, all kinds of lips, womanly, masculine, berry-like, full softness. I drop into the minds of others through KISS and found that none of them had betrayed our location. Sparks pass in the dark hand to hand. My breath deepens and I rest safe again. I find my root home in the dark with my eyes closed. The Lairds and Priory bleed common people. I told villagers. We all embody the divine. We don't need church. Early in October, some of the circle held my he head while I had a vision. The word epileptic didn't exist. I told them, one day soon you may reach hands up and the hands on the other side will be mine. They cry, we don't see that. You will remain with us for a long time, Isabel. I pass by the oldest tree who whispers to another tree. I see it, do you? The tree answers, yes. Our roots run deep underground beneath loam. We sense energy that runs counterflow of our limb sap a shift towards the midday, midday sun, lovely. A shift slightly to the right, the dark would threaten to flay our bark and tear your human veins. A third tree says, Isabel, your time is running out. Be careful and not in harm's way. Isabel is captured. Uh, I'm going to take a, I'm breaking to move forward in the story after Isabel is captured in Pitt and Weem, Scotland, and, um, and is murdered as a teen, but her spirit's speaking to us now. My spirit rises up and rushes across the sky. Love remains in my wake with gorgeous, timeless sparkles. Fat friends find traces of my spirit in the night's glimmering stardust, floating within clouds just above the horizon. Over the dense forests, my spirit resting as red light in fox fur and in red wax berries, a light in the 
birds, feathers, and in the roots mush and mushrooms on the forest floor. A single ghost flower pushes through mulch on the forest floor and my spirit glows within. The fox jumps around the ghost flower. Snowy white owls flock in from the north. They fly over the gathering, over the flowers. My people look overhead to a parliament of owls in one graceful glide. They inhale my spirit like warm summer rain in spring. They walk with confidence, though missing me, but not to the point of despair. I never betrayed their trust. I never told where we met or their names. My love prevails. Lick my legs, I'm on fire! Yeah, I'm gonna read a short poem. Notes from my notes. I misheard someone say Shelley Narwheel. J.C. Lilly traveled to 2121 and found cars that run on water, joyful that there will be a future. Pillar is an anagram of April. Pillar likes the darker skin between the cheeks of Philomena's ass. I recently learned the meaning of the dream of a new room with a closed door as unknown parts of yourself. Assignment for all ages. Open all doors to every room inside. Gertrude Stein must know that I love her. As a ghost? No, as a silver disk of intelligence that fly, floats over the Paris rowdy ghost cemetery. This unstable table. Did the cat like the toy bat? Walking in the No song. Shaman witches work with witches into power. Icons of trees, eggs, orange, and orange hearts float around me, her, them, us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Noel Alumid, and thank you so much for inviting me today. I've done stuff with uh, Beyond Baroque over the years, um, but it's the first time I've been in, the, in this space, I think, since the 90s. So um, <laughs> it's great to be back. Um, I'll be doing two short pieces. One is a semi-autobiographical short story. That's in my current collection. Uh, Music Heard in Hi-Fi and Other Stories, uh, which was published last year. Um, by Rebel Satori that actually focuses on queer spirituality, just so you know. And um, I'll be doing a, a newer piece um, about the moon. I love the moon. I wrote a whole novel called Talking to the Moon. So uh, I wanted to honor um, that tonight. Laconic Messages of Love. You'd sung the Kyrie at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning for the past four years. You'd sung the hymn, one that asked God and Jesus for mercy well over 200 times. It had lost meaning for you. This time during this mass, you want the words to mean something, not because it was Thanksgiving mass and they should mean something, not because hundreds of people are expected to attend, but because this would be the very last time you would sing the Kyrie with the choir. You had lifted the robe above your knees, letting cool air ride up your crotch. The worst thing about sitting up in the choir loft was that all the heat rose to you underneath your robe. You worried that the heat would dull the creases. You meticulously ironed into your pants. You could feel the sweat staining your shirt, and you dreamed of services ending so you can discard, discard the robe forever. 
You turned around to watch the faces of fellow choir members, Filipino men and women who were at least a generation older than you. You softened your vision, making all of what you saw one huge blur. This was the habit you developed to kill time, taking away the definitions of their faces, creating a screen of melded color. What you saw on the screen was earth and brown with a shimmering of orange. For every once in a while, depending on how the sun hit the stained glass, the earth and brown was blessed with purple or red or blue reminding you of all the toy kaleidoscopes you had when you were nine. You squeezed rosaries in your hand and joined the crunching sound they made. You enjoyed the reciting the prayers of the rosary. You felt more comfortable praying to the Blessed Virgin Mary, not because the church recognized her as the Queen of Heaven, not because she, you watched her only, she watched her only son die, but you felt a woman in the Catholic Church would better understand you. Indeed, most of your friends were women, had always been women. Your family wanted you to enter the seminary. They somehow knew you would never marry. Priesthood was the only logical choice. The priesthood was an occupation every good Catholic boy had considered at one point or another. But earlier this year, when you experienced the flesh of a man for the very first time, you knew the priesthood was not for you. It was that kiss that made you decide to leave the choir. It was that kiss that helped you see God. You had been an admirer of the great Catholics. You were familiar with the lives of many saints, but it was the modern Catholics you followed most. You clipped out stories from People Magazine of Corazon Aquino. You still grieved the death of Mother Teresa, and you kept a picture of Pope John Paul on your bedroom wall. You were happy to hear of Pope John Paul acknowledging gays in the church. It was okay to be homosexual, but it was a sin to engage in homosexual acts. So when you went to the gay bars, as long as you didn't dance with a man, you wouldn't be sinning. Frankly, as much as you wanted to, you never danced at all. You've been doing this since you had turned 21, being gay, going to gay places, but careful not to engage in any gay behavior. You made it a point to dress and behave masculinely. You kept your hair conservatively short, and no matter how lonely you felt, no matter how your heart ached for companionship, you never touched another man unless it was a handshake. Until a stranger bumped into you, into you in a bar in West Hollywood. It was dark and the stranger mistook you for someone else. The stranger uttered someone's name and, you, and gave you a hug. Your body recoiled into itself. You made a quick mental prayer noting that you are not hugging this man. God, please know this is not a homosexual act. The stranger's hug was odd. It was not sexual, nor was it friendly. It was simple, polite, barely touching. But you were aware of the fact that you were being entirely enveloped. The stranger pulled away, and a strobe light had fixed itself onto your face, blinding you. You squinted, trying to see, but the strobe light was harsh. You were, you were able to only see when the stranger lifted his head to the left, intercepting the fierce white light. As you blinked, trying to regain your vision, the strong light had created a curious glow behind the stranger's head. You said, you have the wrong person. I don't know you. The stranger, stranger said, maybe someday you will. You had heard many pickup lines before. And what this man said would have been one of those lines if it weren't for the way he said it. There wasn't a hint of seduction, a note of sexual foreplay in this line. The stranger's voice was smooth. If Velvet had a sound, this would certainly be it. The stranger lifted your hand. You saw your hand disappear into the blackness of a silhouette. You felt the stranger's lips rest on the knuckle connected to the forefinger. A gentle kiss, rather motherly, the kind given to a sleeping baby. In a kiss, in a club, the cigarette, cigarettes smoking, rolling past like blue waves, music blaring, songs spewing laconic messages of love, people dancing to a confined claustrophobic space. You felt the presence of God, an overwhelming sense of calmness, a kind of relief, the perception that you would never be hurt, and the belief that you would always be protected. For the first time in your life, you understood the meaning of the word free.
As quickly as it came, the kiss was over, the moment was gone, and so was the stranger departing, disappearing into bobbing heads, matching the beat of the music. The following week, you announced to your choir members that you would be leaving the choir. They threw you a small party. When one of the choir members asked you why you were leaving, you simply said it was time to move on. You didn't say what you truly felt. You didn't say that you had met God, not in a church with an emaciated man on a cross, not in a hymn centuries old, but in a smoky club where men danced with each other. For the first time, sitting in the choir, you sang the Kyrie. Kyrie. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In the fleeting moments of Mass, union mercy had been granted. Thank you. Are you happy about the lunar eclipse? The solar eclipse on Monday? Woohoo! It'll be total. It'll be the last one for the next 20 years, yeah? I love the moon. Whenever the moon is going to cross the sun's path, I rejoice that shit. <laughs> I love the moon. It's a very special time. Back in the Philippines, they used to uh, um, uh, do rice planting ceremonies depending on the lunar cycle. And the Catholics came along and insisted that we use the solar cycle because it was more consistent. This year, it's a very special year in the lunar cycle. It is the year of the dragon. The year of the dragon. It's a very special year. This year alone, 5% of China's population is expected to rise. Because dragon babies are special. Now, let me talk to you about dragon babies. Yeah. Everybody wants them. Women will induce labor so make sure that their kid will be born in the year of the dragon. It says that they're special. They somehow have great leadership qualities, that they'll be more successful, yeah? Now, let's do the math. 5% of a billion people, that's 50 million people. That's more than the state of California. And the Chinese government has been trying really, really hard to convince them to stop, stop observing this occasion like that. 50 million new babies. Babies poop 24-7. China will be literally in a shitstorm. And psychologists did this study, and they found out dragon babies actually are more successful. They wondered, is it because they're born in the year of the dragon? They actually surmised that if your family believes you'll be a success, if your culture believes you'll be a success, if your country believes that you'll be a success, chances are you'll be a success. Teachers will assume you're smarter than all the other kids. Employers will assume that you have more leadership qualities. Now I know that isn't necessarily true here in the United States. I get that. I was born gay. I was born brown. I was born, or I actually left Christianity. And now that I'm north of 40, I've entered another protective class, one that opens me up to age discrimination. So a lot of forces that might tell me or tell you that we weren't made for success. And to all of that, I say, fuck them. Say it with me. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Truly, believe you're a dragon, baby. It is your birthright to be abundant. It is your birthright to be a success. And may I offer this blessing to you as the sun, 
is somehow overtaken by the moon for a few brief moments, please remember, you are stardust. You are special in this universe. May you sweep away old ideas and notions of yourself and clear a path made just for you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am going to do some excerpts um, from a new work that's in progress. It's a multidisciplinary show that will have me in it until I get funding, and then it will have other folks in it, too, and hopefully a set and some costumes. So yes, I'm calling in all the abundance for funding so that it can be moved from a solo show to a collective show. Uh, so I'm just, it's a, the show is called Wild Glitch and um, it's got a mythical storyline with the guide of the show whose name is Glitch. It's got autobiographical material and then like cultural commentary and to boil it down to the most broad strokes. It's about transliberation in apocalyptic times. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to bounce between some, some parts. Um, flying over the sea Wings sprout from my chest, starting over, starting over. Come to me, come to me. I come to you as glitch a quagmire in the system, a cosmic guide to over and underworlds of trans time. Because trans folks are futuristic fossils, capsules of change vibrating non-linearly. In the arc of bone centuries old, we are here bending in tiny tectonics. The bravest of steps start in millimeters. We stretch dominions we stretch dimensions of space, binary systems ripping. We are in the curvature of time tipping. I will take you there, where time broke and space ended, where black holes filled and infinities found their tales, where seeking found its beginning and homecomings wove new roots out of return. We are rewiring the coding of where we start and how we end. Our exit is not coded yet. We are not yet written. We are unwriting the binary in our bones, carving open the sky with the arc of our star marrow, merging constellations, recoding the cage of the body under binary code. The writing is on the walls, ancient and futuristic. Trans time collapses past and future. Gender's infinity loop reverse engineers binary forms through the ever expanding forms of and, stitching back and forth through time and. Trans folks are the gaps and the skips in the system, and we are tugging the threads of this unformed constellation. We are finding our way through the remains of a future we are mid-making. The quivering of the already been and the not yet here leaves us cell shook and ready for the revolution passed on to us by our ancestors.
I want to call my body back home to me. Call my body home. Seismic shifting flesh in my hands, shaking through and through. I seek steadiness in this time-space war, mourning the skin I knew. In one lifetime, fall lines cast askew. I touch that which I shed. When I found out I had chest cancer, I felt like I was suddenly sprung into and suspended in trans time. I landed in a cellular wake up. Something living and mutating in my chest made me stop and see, stop and listen to what I'd been avoiding, feeling, but not fully looking at. If I had top surgery, my chest would be a territory of both loss and freedom. The question to myself was, which hybrid body space, which version of trans body culture do I want to live in? I want to belong in my own body home, and I don't want to sculpt my body with knife and cuts, but with river carve and time care. Glitch says to me, sculpt your own glitched out chest Mess that shit up. You don't have to have your chest only be one kind of way to belong. The roots of trans belonging is in divergence after all. So own that half and half, most non-binary, finary chest. I knew two things. I wanted to keep my nipples. When the doctor draws all over my chest, I etch a sketch my own chest, draw my way out of the binary limits. I say, no thank you to the doctor. You can keep your surgical knife. My chest is a body manifesto on softness and surrender. I had to listen deep past the hard fixed options and find my way through the beyond and beyond the broken binary of the medical establishment. And I praise this non-binary treasure chest. Glitch says, it's the binary that's broken, not us. So go into that place, that place where you think it's all broken and find out that's not you. That's not your insides, not your core, not even a bit. So I say, hell yeah, Mr. Doctor Man. I am that half nip freak parade on the beach that you said I would be. And my people are strutting alongside with me. I was lying on the floor. I was lying on the floor. The house of cards all around, around. The walls collapsing on the ground. So I'm going to switch gears and just read a little bit from um, a piece I wrote called Dear Scream. And I also just wanted to say, I don't have any books for sale out there, but I do have bandanas if anybody wants black bandanas. This is the last red one. Um, and it's my, I have a project called The Cosmos Projects, which is Cosmos with a Q because hello, yes, we are queer magic. Um, so that's Cosmos with a Q with no U because who needs a U when you got a Q? Um, anyways, bandanas are in the bookstore from me, not books, maybe books eventually. All right, I'll just read a little bit from this piece. Um, Dear Scream, you are the cellular code of how we exist. 
You are the origin story and the end game. You are the portal of our transmission, how each of us came to be here, and how some of us will go. You are the live, hot fury we are afraid of and find streaming, the organ at our epicenter. You are the silent protector, our hidden guide. You are the sound ghost of what the oppressed can't utter, the static song of society on loop, the shrilled syncopation of bodies lining up in descent. You are the searing slur of skin set ablaze when one man's protest incited the uprisings of the Arab Spring. You are the broken, bellowing machine of border failure. You, the cries of families swallowed in smoke and mirrors. You are how we keep breathing past the call, last call of suicide. You are how we find our way back. You are the elongated tongue of surrender, the sonic gaps between everything. You are glacial hissing, ancient atmospheres returning form to fluid, and each tiny bubble turning blue monoliths into melt. You are the slow microbooms of the disappearance of ice. You are the choke of climactic howl. You are the frayed razor edges we run our screaming horses to. You are the teacher we find if we bow to you humbly. Then you are deliverance. You are what hollows out the space where we think we know but are surrounded in primordial unknowing. You are the tripwire that brings us back from the digital. You are forgotten graves and buried lives. You are what seeds underground from too much silence. You are what bows to, to silence in the end. You are the slow, long song of a whale, the ancient crossing. You are a love letter carved from bone but left in the marrow unsent. You are the thunder etched into our skins, how we clutch at each other to survive, to feel, to breathe, to know, we are here because you, sorry, I had an issue with my, are the math the earth is adding up through hurricanes and wildfires and tsunamis, the gases of wrongdoing shooting through the hole in the ozone layer, the folded shape of humans down on our knees. You are what holds the picket line taut. You are the empty streets that shout after the marches have ended. You are the break, the bellow, the bark of how we came into a geo body form at all. You are the breaks in the tank at Tenement Square, the split in the bricks of the Berlin Wall. You are what will keep the US border wall from being built. And if it is, you are the whir and whine of worms under that wall. And it is you, the motherboard of wormholes and the wind whipping through that will crack the foundation until it collapses. You are the hum of underground cries, a matrix of the marginalized sound traveling from millennial millennia. You, the course correction the planet has been calling for. You are the G-O-D or the D-O-G we dial out to. But it is you right here, howling and decibels in our mouth, throat, heart, gut. You, the inner electronic dust dervish we make our pilgrimage to. I'll end it there. Thank you so much.
Are the mics on? Can you hear? Okay. Um, well, um, before we get into um, the topic of witches, um, I did want to perhaps uh, to point out what I observed as uh, maybe a thread in um, in your um, work and performance and and um, styles uh, of, about maybe history. I mean, there seems to be a, a some sort of consideration of um, not you know uh, rewriting history or recovering history, but something historical is going on that perhaps is different from other uh, writers and artists that have dealt with, you know, similar uh, witchy topics or occult, esoteric, other knowledges kind of um, topics. Uh, I'm just wondering if we could, each could respond to that question and then we can um, perhaps... <clears throat> Or if anybody is interested. <laughs> oh, yeah, great question, Ramon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, uh, let's see. Well, my character is based on um, a past life of my own as a witch, one of my witch past lives. And so I really did channel her, but I also went to Scotland to the National um, Library of Scotland in Edinburgh. That was wonderful. The librarians are your friends. You write them before you get there, and they'll bring you a stack of books when you get there. And one was the Annals of Pitt and Weem from 1680 or so, or earlier and they were like, just take photographs of all the pages. It's not copyright. And um, anyway, yeah, it's very, I'm very interested in um, researching as well as channeling. And I do, I, yeah, it was such a pleasure to be in that peaceful library. And um, yeah. We're going to go just down the line. All right. All right. I'm next. Um, thank you. Uh, so for me, I have had an inexplicable love of history since childhood. Um, I don't come from a background of not many people in my family have gone to college. And so my, my strangeness has been my interest in obscure aspects of history, almost to a fault from childhood. And it always set me out as like a very weird um, member of my family. <laughs> so it's as weird as my gender nonconformity uh, in lots of ways. Um, it's hard to disentangle one from the other. And um, my so my background is as a historian because I've been pursuing the thrill of archival research and looking at pa like moldered old pages that of, of people's lives that no one that are off the beaten path that no one has looked at. Um, basically my entire adult life, whenever I could get to a city, I go to an archive. Um, I'm definitely an archives hound. Uh, for me, what's very interesting is that so much of history with a capital H as we receive it is the same people citing the same secondary sources. Not a lot of archival research actually happens in our world today. A lot of people are raised to believe that they don't have a stake in history, that they don't have a past. I think that's particularly true for anyone who's been um, marginalized in any way, according to race, class, gender orientation, um, my, along patterns of migration. Um, it's not a common belief to think you have stakes in a, in, a, in a long, rich history, but all of us do. And so for me, it's always been about going into these spaces and reading against the grain of a lot of the, a lot of the records that are kept to kind of find my people to kind of um, like we have this idea of chosen family. And I, for me, that extends to my chosen family tree. And I think that what's interesting you say about librarians being our friend, Shelley, is, you know, we're living in a really unprecedented time where that is the case. It hasn't always been the case. It's only very recently that libraries and institutions have even cared about collecting histories of marginalized people from our own, from their own perspectives. Histories by us, for us. It's a. It's only the past 
couple of decades, really, and that larger institutions have opened up their repositories to people like me who want to find stories of like sex and witchcraft that there's no way I would have been let in to places that you have to have a certain type of educational degree and pedigree and letters of recommendation to get into. So I'm all about like liberating those stories from the past. Anyone can do it. You'll find something really different than I will. But part of my magical spiritual practice is actually to go into those places to find those stories um, and then to take, take out fragments of people's life stories and try to do magic with them. Um, and then also try to find and recover history elsewhere. So um, flea markets, estate sales, uh, old bookshops. Mm. Um, and there's a, and, and there's a lot that remains to be found. So if you feel ever like alone in the world, and I felt alone a lot in my life. Um, one of my responses intuitively has been to look to find my own past, but anyone can do it. Um, so yeah, history is really important to me. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I began to, to do a deep dive into rather a deep unpacking of history about, 2004, 2005, when I was working on my second novel called Talking to the Moon. Um, and the Philippines and Filipinos are kind of, kind of were interesting a lot because and when we talk about history, they only count the four, last 400 years. Like they'll just talk about when when Europe came, right? <laughs> that is when our history began. I'm like, actually, we have a history that's way before that, you know? And so being able to dig and research that. And um, there was a really amazing. Um, ethnographer named C.R. Moss from UC Berkeley, who did this really deep dive into the indigenous mountain province of the Philippines, where I was born, where I'm from. Um, and it, he calls it just sort of like a like a notation of um, spiritual practices, but I call it um, a book of spells, actually, because he had um, written down the the spells that um, priests and priestesses used, you know, to cure people, you know, to help people. And I thought that was fantastic, you know. And so I began to own that, and a big part of that was um, being able to uh, take a look at um, lunar cycles and the moon. And um, it's interesting when we talk about Witches and witchery, um, I guess the language that I knew before that was, it was, um, uh, at least in cultures that I'm more, more familiar with, is the, the whole practice of animism, you know, um, spirits in the trees, spirits in, in, in clothing that, 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 that we have, that I think we just as people all over the world, you know, uh, recognize that the importance of the earth or, 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 the, or the universe is just a, a part of who we are and who we came to be. You know, um, but sometimes in in academia, you know, the spirituality is cut off from that, unfortunately. So, um, thanks, Ramon, for having us all and for the question. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll start by saying I think. Um, First of all, just living in the world at this current moment, and then also with writing this show, um, which is trying to cast a larger web of moving beyond binaries in general is, is, is hearkening back to pre-colonial times and um, how much our world needs that now, like from every culture and every country is we, that's where we need to be coming from. Um, and, uh, and, and in terms of ancestors, you know, in most cultures across the world, you know, in pre-colonial times, there just weren't all these divisions, right? So, uh, yeah, I, um, I've been in touch with the One Institute recently, and it is very cool that we live in the, um, the city that has the, the oldest archive, LGBTQ archive um, in the country. Um, so I, I am wanting to kind of call upon some, some ancestors who I don't yet know about um, that are not my ancestors. Uh, so that's part of the work that I'm hoping to be doing as I go forward with writing the work. And then um, I was just in a residency for three weeks, which was I'm so grateful for, um, at the Atlantic Center for the Arts, working with someone who's a dear old friend and mentor, Sharon Bridgeforth. If you don't know their work, I definitely recommend looking them up. Um, and she, she activates a very incredible ancestral lineage context in which we were all making our work. And so all of us had, you know, lots of things came through. And I didn't realize until I was in that setting that Glitch is, is both not born and also is an ancestor. Um, so I, I learned a lot about Glitch, who I already knew was the guide of the show and I knew things about and had started to have 
a feeling for who this this being was. Um, and then it was it was once I was there that I realized that, of course, Glitch is embodying multiple times and is an ancestor. Uh, and then I did some direct writing that I didn't read from tonight that um, that is calling upon some ancestral um, lineage of my own family. Um, and I last thing I'll say is that I just found out at the end of last summer that a cousin has some footage of uh, a cousin from the late 1800s, like the early 1900s, I think it was. And, um, uh, and, and she was published and, and when was published under a man's name, which was pretty, you know, usual for the times, but actually a lot of folks feel like she was trans. Um, I don't know what their pronouns would have been, but anyways, there's some footage. So I'm really excited to be able to see the moving living body of that person soon. So thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, I just have one more question and then we'll open it up for, um, for the audience. Um, uh, I just want to mention that, uh, yes, it's the uh, eclipse on Monday, but um, I didn't plan it that way. I, I truly do think it was channeled for us to meet here because I just found out yesterday that it was Monday and then it kind of clicked. Oh, well, you know, it, this was meant to happen when it did without us really trying or without me knowing actually. But um, I, I I just wanted to, to hear what, um, what you thought about something related to what I, you know, what, what I just uh, observed from our readers and performers, but also I was wondering in terms of your own practice, is it, uh, is it for you something that you practice in terms of some other knowledges or uh, mysticism, the esoteric, the occult, uh, or is it more of you're interested in in the topic and the forms. I think what seems to be consistent is that it's also there isn't this division between poetry and music or song and um, prose and uh, the visual arts. You know, um, Shelley um, has some beautiful images in in her book. Um, to August in a row in a row, and also as a visual artist. So th there isn't this division of art forms, which is more, uh, I think, ancient or more primal at a time, you know, and transcestral. And, and I, you know, I really am interested in that because we are so divided by our education and not just in whatever art forms we practice or choose to do, but in so many ways, and we forget that at one point, there weren't all these divisions, you know, and I'm just wondering if that's something that you've thought about in terms of your own practice. Is it, do you practice something in particular, uh, channeling or, or uh, I don't know what it could be, something else? Um, I'm just wondering. <laughs> that's um that's a like four directions oh. question which isn't that's great it's very you know in many directions so i'm like okay well i guess ever since i've been was little i would have prophetic dreams um but as i grew older i became someone who learned how to meditate and I find that's a consistent practice to meditate every day. And that's a way of um, being uh, present and being able to react to what's in front of me and not bring my history with me and um, personal history. Uh, and then my visual art and writing practice is I do bring my history with me and, you know, work with that energy or those energies, the myriad. And um, it's, it is complicated to, uh, now I'm trying, I really am trying to jump around from the four corners of your question. <laughs> no, I mean, no, the, it's, it's uh, Yeah, no, I wanted to give some context it's, about you know, the, you know, there, there was not this division, I think, historically right. between the art and whether you um, 
you know, approached it that way in terms of when you created something, do you have a, a spiritual practice of some sort? Right, I see. The, um, yeah. well, so the spiritual is, practice, we can I focus think, on that. I think it's Jungian, and I'm, you know, mining my dreams, I'm mining my intuitions, I'm, you know, I'll make drawings and then write about what I see in those drawings, so it's a way to access my subconscious as well. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's more to that question, but I did. I studied Sufism, I studied Buddhism, um, I, you know, and I've, which, I'm a solitary witch in a way, but you know, I was a witch in a lot of past lives, so it's, I don't know. Anyway, it's a lot of, it's a lot. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, I think you did. And um, Brooke also is marvelous, uh, it's definitely a marvelous visual artist as well. You're, thank you. Um, so I think, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, it is true, academic disciplines are an invention of mostly the 18th century, uh, and therefore should be questioned, as most Western knowledge systems that emerge from that time are <laughs> very suspicious, um, because they were sort of about categorizing and therefore hierarchy, hi giving hierarchy to knowledge, and putting a lot of the things that I care about and uh, sort of not counting them, not counting experience as knowledge, not counting um, song or folklore or storytelling as knowledge. And so, yeah, I'm always very uh, suspicious of any type of disciplinary boundary. I think for me, I, I try to bring a, a sense of ritual to any type of act of creativity. And so what that means for me is creating ritual is so much about intuition. You can study histories of magical correspondences between the elements and the planets and the stars and herbs and colors and animals and objects. And so much of magic making is about understand is about building correspondences between yourself and the natural world around you uh, to sort of heighten your intentions for how you want to live in the world. But um, for me, it's about bringing that kind of mentality of anything is on the table. Anything that I know, I could draw from intuitively to work with. So the more I know, the stronger I am in my creative act. But that doesn't mean I have to know anything. You can start from nothing, because it's intuition. Um, but I do a lot of research, a very research-heavy based practice. And, and um, kind of relating to what I, the, your earlier question about history, you know, history survives in fragments. And so when I look at the past and it's meaning to me, the only way to really honor the fragmentary nature of what survives is to respond creatively to it. Because cre creative work has a subjectivity that I feel like is just more honest about what we can't know and what we can't access about ourselves, about the past, about the world around us. So it's like a, to kind of face that loss or that fragmentary nature with the act of creation is most satisfying to me. And so I see any type of visual arts practice, writing practice, as kind of like filling in these, filling in these gaps. Um, and, and to me, that is an act of, like, of ritual engagement with the world around me, as well as ritual engagement with like the, the person I hope to become, uh, ritual engagement and being kind to the person, the people I have been in my life. Uh, and I think I can leave it there. Um, but yeah, it's like form fits function, whatever I need, it takes, the, the form reveals itself to me often in the process of research and, and kind of listening to my own intuition. Yeah, that is a big question, but thank you for asking it because um, the way I, I look at it a couple different ways is, um, first of all, I think that the panel here and just the discussion of spirituality in queer space is so important because what Pew did a research, did, did studies then what 50% of LGBT people are non-believers like and you want you can know and you know why right? I mean that we don't you know um, observe or affiliate you know because of the trauma of religion and and and, and certain spiritualities in our lives and um, which made me um, very sad I was I was I served on the community advisory board for children's hospital on their uh, young men's study yeah um, particularly when it came to preventing HIV and they found that um, 
men have sex with men and um, trans women actually um, took better care of themselves and protected themselves if they had a spiritual life. Yeah, more than people who, LGBT people, or at least um, gay men or um, bi and, and trans women who didn't, which I thought was a really interesting thing. And um, I, when I went to divinity school, uh, the difference between divinity school and, and a master's in divinity as opposed to a master in religion is that religion is, is an academic study of religion as opposed to divinity is a, um, it is a, a study and practice, right? And uh, we, they did a, a, where I went to school, and a lot of divinity schools do this. They're, they're really great about interfaith. That's, that's awesome, you know, that's the, to, to learn how to, to, to deal in an interfaith manner. Say, if we're in a hospital, we want to be able to work with people of who's Muslim, who's Jewish, who's Hindu, who's Buddhist, the, the five major food groups, right? <laughs> you know? But I don't think we're really good about you know, more quote unquote witchy practices, more, more um, animistic, more and more, you know, and um, I have a genuine curiosity about that because um, I have lots of friends who engage in the practice and um, that actually, I think atheism has studied more than, <laughs> you know, than, um, than what we're doing here, you know, and um, I, you know, um, I am ordained. And so I want to, to, to be there for people, um, in varying degrees of their spiritual practice, you know, whether it be, um, uh, whether it's being a witch or observing crystals or all of that stuff that I, I really genuinely want to um, meet them where they are, as, as they'll say in divinity school. You, know, you need to meet people where they are, and if that's true, some people can't meet us at this level, you know. They're just not trained to, um, which is unfortunate. Um what to say. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I think one thing I was struck by is that everybody wrote, everybody spoke to or wrote about a moment or about the darkness or the dark. Um, and then I was trying to look at what I had written down scribbling in the dark and I can't read my writing cause it was dark. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like for me, a big part of my intuitive spiritual practices is, is actually a deep trust in, in the unknown, um, and the darkness and, um, yeah, like I know that I'm off in life and in my creative practice when I'm coming from too much of a knowing place. And that's not to say like, I love all kinds of knowledges and being informed and all that stuff, but you know what I'm saying? So it's just, um, I mean, I have all kinds of daily practices as I'm sure we all do. Um, I guess, uh, I feel excited that we live in a time where there's so many um, spiritual technologies uh, and using decks is one of the ones that I love the most. Um, uh, yeah, tarot and blessing decks. And there's just, there's so many amazing ones and so many amazing queer and trans ones. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like that's a, that's often really helps me. And so inside of my creative practice, like there are times where I'll just, pause and, and draw cards. Um, and that, and I feel like that really just like totally, it's like, it just calls in all of, all of what I, you know, couldn't, couldn't access before I drew the cards, um, and often helps me go in new directions or, um, write kind of from an unexpected angle. Um, yeah. So I feel like that's one of the, the things that I love the most that does, dovetail specifically with my creative practice. Um, but yeah, also vacillating between like movement and stillness. Like a lot of times, like, you know, it's like we think of sitting and meditation, moving meditation is, is hugely important for me. And often, um, some of my songs will come when I'm, when I am moving. Um, and I try to be phoned down. I think turning the phone off and putting the phone away is, is actually one of the like most important acts that <laughs> like, we can take as witches and spiritual people. So yeah, when I put my phone away and go and walk somewhere, um, that is often when I will channel. And for me, the writing of songs is, uh, is often, um, it's something beyond what I, what I know, um, and I'm planning for. So thanks. Okay. Well, um, thank you. Let's open it up for, um, questions from, from the audience. Um, there's one there. Uh, I have a question for Brooke. Um, 
you you mentioned in, in, in your piece you were you were talking about um, the the uh, ubiquity or, or uh, and the the um, of, of of simply gossip about commerce mm -hmm. as a theme. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had heard of the copper merchant ANS here. Um, I, I, I think it's it just one of those, uh, I, I feel like it would add some, some it's, it's a, a historical touch point that, that would add, add some, some richness for you uh, to this theme in particular. Um, and Nasir was an ancient copper merchant and many, many clay tablets um, remain that are basically bad reviews of his business. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. I love that. I work a lot with copper because it's Venusian, and I work a lot with l l love goddesses throughout. So that's very helpful for me to know. I also, I mean, it's a great tragedy of my life that I cannot read the like millions of cuneiform tablets that survive because I know that millions of them survive and remain untranslated. And that's a big loss for me as a history lover. So can you just say the name one more time? N A S I R E A. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Yeah, somebody else has a question. I think there's one in the back. Um, I have a question, but it's kind of two, in two parts. So you guys talked about spirituality, uh, and I'm wondering uh, what do you envision uh, the future of spirituality to look like, <laughs> and how would someone how would you introduce it to people who haven't considered spirituality after, say, like a uh, Christianity kind of trauma? Um, it's, it's a question to, I guess, all of you, or whoever wants to answer. Uh, that's a specific one. Sorry, what was the second one? So, um, how would you go about introducing people who have a trauma of religion? That's actually the main one, probably, yeah. So I think that's a really beautiful question. And the simple answer, although I would love to talk to you later about it, um, that I would give people who would come into the bookshop is, you know, it is a gift that you can give to yourself to take space and time out of your day to just light a candle for yourself and sit with it and just see how you feel in candlelight. And I always feel like in that moment of just taking time for myself, having nothing in the way of even my thoughts, but a little bit of candlelight instantly makes magic for me. And if you feel like a little bit of like the hair on the back of your neck stand up, or if you feel nothing at all, like it doesn't make you any more or less a witch. It doesn't make you any more or less a spiritual being. Um, but it's just about the practice of, of, of honoring that no matter how much you tend to it, you, you have a spiritual side. It's just, and so the more you can just light that candle and spend time with yourself, the more you'll feel it. Um, and then if you are a very voracious reader or you love art. I mean, there are just so many ways into spirituality through cultivating beauty in your life. Um, so ways in which I feel connected to the divine it could be as simple as walking my dog every day, dogs now, um, or just reading a book that I love. Like I'll just read my favorite book and feel in touch with something greater than myself as well as in touch with like where love comes from the universe to me. But that is what I used to say to people when they would come in to the shop. Um, because there are a lot of spiritual seekers out there who have been sort of set off their path because of very doctrinal organized religion. That doesn't mean you can't find God from organized religion. It's just the future of, of spirituality might involve us having to kind of break down some of those assumptions around what organized religion can or cannot do. Um, and to do that, you just start by spending time with yourself. Um, and in ways that are nourishing. Oh, or I'm just giving that to you because you're know. <laughs> <laughs> anyone could be. Did, did someone else want to go now? I can go, but okay. either way. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just start with, I mean, I think 
you know, the organized religion situation <laughs> for queer and trans people. It's not fun. Um, although luckily there are, you know, many permutations. Um, but I, I feel like the, the basic, basic, simple act of, of just deciding and knowing that you can literally decide what spirit or God is. And I think the, uh, encouraging people to think of something that's strange or funny as their God and to, as, as the entry point, as like the portal to eventually getting to a place where like, maybe it becomes like something more quote unquote sacred, but literally, you know, like a donut or like whatever something is that somebody really loves, um, that whatever can, anything can be spirit. Right. Um, so I think that's one thing just to take it completely out of any box of, of, um, organized religion. And Brooke, I loved the moment in your writing where you talked about, I forgot how you put it, but the hardening, like, it's like, there's a hardening that happens with organized religion. I think many of us, um, have drawn from multiples. So I think just being a possible, like trying Um, and then I think like, uh, honestly, I feel like, uh, for so many of us, nature, which is a very like universal way of putting it, but, um, spiritual practice and just deep connection can come through that, through whatever connection, uh, with the earth, the water. Um, and I think with the times that we're in, uh, with climate collapse. Um, I feel like, I feel like the future holds us like learning to be not only spiritually adaptive, but to be inside of the new rhythms that are being created across the world. Uh, the pacing with which things are happening, you know, with hurricanes and all the things, fires, things we experience here. Um, and I, I think the force and the ways that is happening in the world, like, of course, there can be fear for many people. And I think that us learning to let nature's response to our fucking the climate, like, you know, us learning to, to learn still from those new rhythms, right? So, and even if some of that is scary, you know, what are the ways that our spiritual practices can um, live in a call and response with the planet as it's as it is shifting because of our of our harms. I think we have question. Oh, oh I was going to just say something kind of quick to that. Um, two, uh, maybe two things. One is that um, I had a correspondence with Sinead O'Connor about ten years ago. And um, all I wrote was, sister, we have to reclaim that religion. It doesn't, it shouldn't be theirs only. And she wrote back, or she wrote back, sister. I don't know if I said sister. But, but I was like, you know, you, yes, you go reclaim it. You know, the spirituality, this religion can be reclaimed in the future and reformed, but also um, I feel like it should be really private and should be like sex is kept private. And so, you know, maybe your religious practices should be kept private too. So, um, and then on on the other other hand, I want to at some point gather people to do like big group rituals. So in the future, yeah, I, I just really quickly. I mean, to, I think we know to some degree where religion's headed. Like we know that more younger people are leaving. Right? That it's just they're just not into it. And I think part what will happen a prediction is that religions will actually become more inclusive and say, "All right, we love we like." queer people after all, you know, <laughs> you know well, they'll start saying stuff like that, but that isn't necessarily a, a good thing. I was at, at the LGBT Pride Festival some years ago, and a, um, a queer trans um, Christian um, was talking to me, and I said, oh, I'm Buddhist. I'm like, oh, you should become Christian. 
you know, I'm like, okay, enough. <laughs> okay, so it's great that, you know, it might be inclusive, but this, I know, it was like, please, no, no, no more colonizing. I, I, that's happened to me before, you know, so, so I, you, you know, so there's that. So there's interesting conversations with that, the, you know, but I will say what, what's been influential to me and perhaps a lot of young people is sort of like the religion of social media. Like some of the practices that I've learned have been from, you know, um, witch talk, I gotta say, you know, which is on TikTok and things like that, and just you know, terror readers on 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 on, um, on um, different social media that 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 are, are saying some really interesting things, and they're reaching large audiences. So I think that what's going to happen is that I think we're as we sort of keep scrolling through our phones, unfortunately, that that would be an influential um, uh, way of how we believe and and uh, see God actually. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. We have any questions? It looks like um, we are done then. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'll see you next week, hopefully. The um, Poets and Translation on Friday, and there'll be there's many other programs. So, thank you for coming. Thank you so much.